Uh, welcome everybody. This is Doug McCall from the International School Health Network. Pleased to be chairing this uh, open web meeting of the Fresh Partnership. Uh, really pleased to be having this discussion about the Futures of Education Commission and pleased to be welcoming both Noah and Karen, who Noah works uh, for the commission and Karen is a commissioner with the commission. And as well, uh, Martin Henry from Education International and Dan Leach from Simon Fra Fraser University, who will be acting as discussants and comm commentators to get us started. Uh, as if you've had a chance to read the um, session description on the FRESH website, uh, you'll see that this is a chance for a beginning of a discussion within the FRESH partnership about submitting a brief to the commission. Uh, we, uh, I, I had hoped initially to, um, to be able to have a draft brief available for this session, but um, I had the joy of reading through all the materials that the commission has been working with. And so <laughs> that timeline has been extended a little bit, um, but uh, it's really a, a very interesting and fascinating topic and the session, I'm looking forward to it. So I'm gonna ask uh, Noah to uh, uh, share his screen and begin the presentation, then ask uh, uh, Martin and Dan to comment and ask questions and then open it up for a broad discussion. And then Karen, if okay, you want I'll, to- Okay, I'll add a little bit after Noah, perhaps. Perfect, that's great. Okay, okay. thanks. Uh, Noah, do you wanna share your screen then? Sure, and Karen, if you wanna come in at any point, don't hesitate to interrupt. Um, totally I haven't happy. seen this presentation yet, so I'm looking forward to absorbing. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Good. Uh, all right, everyone. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm Noah Sovi. Uh, I am, as Doug mentioned, a uh, senior project officer at UNESCO, uh, working in the secretariat to the International Commission, so helping to lead on futures of education and support uh, Karen and her colleagues uh, in this project. Uh, I mean, overall, we uh, characterize my screen to go forward um, this as uh, an initiative to re-envision uh, how knowledge and learning can shape the futures we want, can shape the future of humanity, can shape the future of, of the living planet. Now, this is an exercise that UNESCO has uh, undertaken uh, basically every generation. So every 25 years or so, um, UNESCO is engaged in uh, this sort of stepping back visioning process to try and get a grasp on the challenges we face at the time, what we perceive to be on the horizon for the future, and how education um, can be best positioned uh, to respond and prepare us to respond. So the first of these exercises took place in the early 1970s under the leadership of an international commission chaired by Edgar Faure. Uh, some of you may be more familiar with uh, the edition of this that took place in, in the mid 90s under the leadership of Jacques Delors led to a, um, a report, uh, Learning the Treasure Within. And you know these previous editions have been, um, I would say uh, somewhat influential in helping to set the global education agenda. The Learning to Be report is one of the pieces that um, really put the lifelong learning uh, conversation front and center. Um, learning the treasure within emphasized uh, learning to live together and, and um, maybe a more humanistic vision of, 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 of education um, than was coming from some other uh, sources at the time. I also include here a 2015 report, which is in some ways a bit of a dress rehearsal for the current uh, project, uh, Rethinking Education Towards uh, a global common good. Uh, a couple things that uh, I think, and you know, Karen, as I said, feel free to chime in, that I think are really important uh, to understand going into this. Um, the first is that we use the horizon of 2050 and beyond, um, and that's quite uh, intentional for several reasons. Um, uh, one, uh, it's to be clear that this is not uh, immediate post-30 planning exercise. Um, the 2030 agenda, um, the SDGs, of course, particularly SDG 4, um, although 13 as well, uh, are really important um, uh, foundation for this work. Um, 
but the feeling is that uh, it's also useful for us to take a longer term perspective uh, to look to 2050 and beyond, which is about a generation from now. So people who um, you know, have students in primary school, children in primary school, um, those children may have children in primary school uh, in 2050. So that's one way to think about um, you know, this exercise of, of thinking about what the next generation needs uh, to create the next futures. Um, so uh, again, to emphasize, uh, this is not in any way to depart from uh, the 2030 agenda, although I do think um, that uh, there's a number of ideas the commission's been working with um, that uh, are attempting to address and build on maybe some of the shortcomings um, or some of the pieces that are unaddressed uh, in the 2030 agenda. The second thing that uh, is really important to mention at the outset is the use of futures in the plural. Now this, uh, again, is very deliberate. Um, when we were doing some of the landscape mapping at the start of the project uh, to try and get uh, a sense of what conversations were um, taking place around uh, the futures of education, almost unanimously, they were conversations about the future of education. Uh, and quite often those conversations were were enunciated from a particular position <laughs> in the world um, as if envisioning a single future for all. So the, the use of futures in the plural, which translates uh, diff with difficulty, <laughs> um, is intentional. Uh, I would say, uh, you know, for two reasons. One, it's pragmatic to recognize that there will be multiple futures um, there will be difference. Um, education will take different forms um, in the future. Uh, but second, that that's desirable, um, that uh, an educational world uh, that includes a diversity of uh, institutions, a diversity of learning opportunities, uh, uh, a sort of rich and varied ecosystem um, is a source of strength. So this commission um, this, this project uh, is, it features at its core uh, an international commission that's chaired by um, the president of Ethiopia, Her Excellency uh, Madame Saleh Work Zode. Uh, she's joined by uh, Karen Mundy and uh, a couple other equally brilliant people um, from different parts of the world. Um, it's a geographically diverse group, but also uh, a diverse group in terms of the areas of expertise um, that people bring in, uh, whether they're from politics, the world of activism, uh, science, business, and of course, a strong representation from education. The International Commission is supported by an advisory board of key um, partners and actors uh, in uh, mostly in the international uh, uh, educational development space. Um, I, if you uh, want to look carefully uh, over this, you can check out the project's website, uh, which goes into, into great detail uh, on this. Uh, I think that um, to really grasp what's uh, uh, in play here, it's important to um, uh, think that may or think a little bit about the ways that this is maybe a slightly different enterprise this time than in the two previous um, editions. Um, I mean, I think we're at a point um, uh, in the world where uh, it's uh, it's increasing. Well, certainly, when using a, a 30 year horizon and looking out to 2050, um, it's really difficult to have a, a blueprint um, that can safely take us there. Um, and the overall objective of the project here is to, is to catalyze an ongoing debate. So to uh, have the report from the commission be an initial uh, intervention, um, a provocation um, in this ongoing discussion um, about how we make uh, the futures we want using education, using learning, um, using knowledge. Um, and, uh, I think that, as you'll see, if you've had a chance to look at the progress update, um, you know, there's uh, a, a desire for what the commission to produces um, to be very concrete, 
to, to touch earth and uh, lead to um, suggestions and recommendations that can be implemented, um, but also to cause some, some thinking and some rethinking of, uh, of the principles, the values, the guiding, the things that guide our decisions. Um, and uh, we'll go into that in just a sec. A key feature of the project, and that's part of the reason why we're here today, um, is that it embeds uh, a consultation process uh, trying to um, bring into the project the ideas uh, of both the general public and uh, of experts. Um, we have to date engaged about a million people. Um, we have uh, some online platforms, um, surveys and so forth um, that about 100,000 people have taken part in. Um, we accept um, you know, written comments and uh, artwork actually um, from, uh, from people of all ages and have about close to 4,000 submissions there. Uh, and then we extensively do uh, webinars and events um, and I also have a very active uh, project of focus groups, uh, which have now included about 6,000 people. Um, over 400 focus groups have taken place um, in, in all parts of the world. Uh, I'm gonna indulge myself and just show you two things that we produced as part of this, because I think they give a bit of the flavor of the spirit uh, of what we're trying to provoke um, in these consultations. These are um, some videos that we produced um, uh, for people to use either as the stimulus for a focus group discussion or to use in classrooms um, just to really uh, mobilize this debate. So uh, very short pieces, um, you know, asking people to think about what we learned, for example, um, what we need to learn from school, learn in school, what we can learn um, in other places, what needs to be different. Also asking people to think about um, you know, what we learn online as compared to what we learn in school and also um, how uh, education can, can solve the climate crisis um, or the contributions it can make. Uh, the analysis of all these inputs is, is ongoing. Um, and uh, I put up here some reports that we commissioned uh, analyzing the focus group discussions. Um, and also we got some art education researchers to do a really amazing analysis of, of the artwork that's been submitted. And uh, I thought I would just pause for a second and um, summarize some of the key things that are coming in um, through this process. Uh, you know, one is that there's, there's a strong agreement um, on the need to position education as a global common good. Um, the, there's similarly uh, uh, a, a pretty uh, shared sense of the challenges that we face, climate change, uh, environmental destruction, um, uh, biodiversity loss, these are things um, that come to the top of people's list, as does inequality um, and the persistence of inequality. And with COVID-19, um, the worsening of inequalities, the, um, the need to continue our efforts to eradicate mm -hmm. poverty, also uh, technological change and concerns about the future of work. Um, there are some interesting regional and demogra other demographic uh, differences, um, but by and large, um, these are shared concerns um, that are motivating people to turn to education um, and think about ways education can address them. And the, the final thing that we see um, pretty consistently across all these inputs um, is a recognition that education um, it plays a really important role in individuals' lives, in empowering and in generating opportunities. Um, but that's quite often simultaneously accompanied by uh, uh, an appreciation of, of the, the social role um, that education plays, um, that it's necessarily collective um, and you know, many people perceiving challenges uh, point to the role that education pl can play in reshaping values, identities, um, and, and purposes. Let me quickly, um, just go over uh, another track of the consultation, which has been to activate um, expert groups, um, you know, like like you all, um, 
uh, to also provide their ideas. Uh, UNESCO has a, a chairs network. I won't go over each of these items, um, um, but we've activated UNESCO institutes. We have an ideas lab on our website. Um, we commissioned a whole set of background papers um, and they're all available on, on the futures, um, futures of Education website. Uh, let me now move to talking uh, about the work of the commission, um, although I feel Karen should be the one to be presenting this. Um, so please come in, Karen, and, 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 and add your thoughts. Uh, there have been three major uh, publications from the commission, um, uh, the first of which was envisioned, the second two weren't, but the first of which was the, is a visioning and framing document that came out after the commission's first meeting. Um, then, uh, which was in January uh, of 2020. Um, and then in March uh, of, of 2020, we all know um, sort of what disruptions started to roll um, across the world. The commission, um, you know, thought that uh, it could play a useful role uh, to come in, particularly as, uh, um, uh, I mean, I think you'd agree, we're at a moment now where a lot of decisions taken in the short term will have major, uh, significant long-term future shaping consequences. Um, so the, the commission issued a joint statement and then a somewhat longer report in June of uh, 2020, uh, Education in a Post-COVID World, Nine Ideas for Public Action. Uh, now I know, I think I saw that Doug distributed uh, at least this and some other things uh, as part of the um, preparatory meeting materials for this meeting. Um, so if you haven't, had, if you've had a chance to look at it, um, uh, you you've had a chance to skim what those nine ideas are. I, I'm not going to talk through each of them. Uh, I mean, we can if you want, but um, uh, I guess I would just say that it's not. Uh, um, it's important that this was not a um, like a preliminary draft of the commission's report, although it does give an indication of, of, of the commission's thinking, um, you know, for example, around the importance of, uh, of the right to education and considering how it uh, might need to be expanded um, on uh, the importance of, of the teaching profession and teaching collaboration um, on the importance of the social space of the school and so forth. Um, uh, more recently, however, and uh, Doug, you, you also distributed the progress update. Is that right? Yes, just a link to it. Yes. Okay. So uh, more recently, the commission uh, put out um, an update uh, that uh, <coughs> includes um, a preliminary outline of the report and an articulation of, of, of some uh, main, um, main lines of argument. Um, that uh, are being um, developed. Um, uh, I put up here some bullet points uh, of, of some of the, uh, I would say some of the key things that um, I think are being called for in this progress update. Um, Karen, uh, you should please feel free to come in um, to see, to comment on what you're seeing um, uh, being developed. But maybe I'll close with just offering like a, here's my sense of, of the narrative that's developing. Um, and it would be uh, particularly great to get um, input from all of you kind of on um, what's included here, what's omitted, uh, what needs to be enhanced. Um, but to begin from uh, a recognition that we, we, despite all the challenges that we, we, we live with and, and see and try to address in our work, there has been intense progress in human development in the last 50 years. Um, we have seen uh, global poverty levels decline. We have seen standards of living rise. Uh, we do live healthier and longer lives um, and, and more and more children and youth benefit from education and training. Um, but there's no question that um, uh, some of our patterns of development are unsustainable. Uh, there's no question that we are, are, are addressing multiple overlapping crises um, that really uh, threaten our shared future. Um, you know, and then when we look uh, prospectively um, at some of the challenges on the horizon, so um, the possible ways that uh, climate change uh, 
and environmental change could develop, um, the possible ways that um, technology and technological disruption um, could emerge, uh, we, uh, we would be right to have even greater concerns. Um, so the, the, the argument put forth um, so far as it's being shaped uh, is that we need to radically change course uh, to ensure uh, that uh, we have um, just futures, socially, economically, environmentally just and sustainable futures for all. Um, that changing course uh, involves a, a reframing um, of what it means to be human, a redefinition of our relationships with with each other, with the living planet, with technology. Um, you know, there's, I think, a strong sense that um, we need to relearn something about our interdependencies. We need to reimagine our, our human place and, and agency um, in, in, a, in a world that's, that's more than human. Um, education um, can, can, can help set us on paths towards these more just and sustainable futures. Um, you know, we, we have been somewhat successful, but there's a lot um, uh, that remains uh, in front of us uh, just to deliver on the promises of the past, um, you know, just to ensure the right to a meaningful emancipatory uh, education for all. Um, so the call that's being put forward, uh, I would characterize as, as, as in some ways a call for renewal. Um, you know, I need to renew education um, so that it can, can achieve uh, its, uh, transformative, its transformative potential. Um, and uh, specifically, I think that um, the need to rebalance the relationship between education as a public and collective uh, endeavor and its place as a private undertaking is something the commission is, is grappling with. Um, I think the commission is also working um, on ensuring that uh, recommendations that will help ensure that education is organized and governed in a way that resists the, uh, um, the commodification uh, of the knowledge commons. Um, I also, uh, it, you know, the commission's also working on, um, you know, trying to carve out what will be um, uh, sort of the best balanced approach to take to um, the use of digital technology in education, um, ensuring that it, uh, it serves public education as a common good um, and builds capacity for collective caring, sharing, creation. Um, and uh, alongside that, protecting and transforming the, the unique um, social learning space of the school as one of the key pillars of inclusive um, educational ecosystems um, that benefit all. Um, and uh, I think that the, the, the position being taken is that you know, there is much that we do already um, that moves us in these directions. Um, and all those initiatives represent seeds of hope um, that need to be um, supported uh, and nurtured. So I'll close with that. That's my characterization of the work of your commission, Karen. Do you want to come <laughs> in with anything? <laughs> well, you, you, you and the secretary have been really a, a great, um, great at sort of taking the diverse views of the commissioners and then kind of putting them together in a way that has a kind of consistent narrative arc. So thank you, um, Noah. I maybe just would make a couple of observations. Uh, as Noah has said, the time frame for this is a little different than you might get uh, when you're thinking about uh, the shorter term, i.e. how do we sort of build back better post-pandemic, the medium term, which is sort of how do we get to 2030 goals and objectives versus this 2050 horizon. But I, I, I guess no matter what your time horizon, you need a pathway to get from here to there. And so one of the the, the challenges the commission faces is trying to describe what needs to be done in the short, the medium and long term. So I'm especially interested to hear from this group um, in particular about this interface between health and education 
and between uh, global health governance and global education governance. We're now seeing a world in which global governance of health is very fragmented, very fractured. And in fact, of course, um, you know, the, the common phrase uh, of vaccine nationalism is, is very much demonstrating some of those fragmentations. So I'd, I'd be interested to hear how you think from the health side about creating a global commons and achieving this balance between short-term objectives and this longer-term uh, preparation for what's undoubtedly going to be a, a 30 years of major transformations in uh, human societies, political, economic, technological. Uh, and I think just to emphasize, although it came late in, in Noah's slide, I think the commissioners are very interested in what do we do to build a common foundation at the global level, but also country level national ownership and public commons at the national level that is within existing uh, regions and states and with a special focus on equity, which is I think a real challenge as we see um, pressures on education systems to diversify. So these multiple futures can have a very positive uh, liberatory meaning, but it can also have a very uh, negative and illiberal um, uh, meaning. Already, I mean, I would say one of the biggest lessons from the pandemic is that we, we now see kind of in a very stark form that our education systems are already producing different futures for a generation of children. In my uh, home province of Ontario, rich kids were able to learn online very easily. Kids from less advantaged homes still don't have, still don't have microphones. They mostly have computers, but they still don't have microphones. In Toronto right now, they've just announced school by school closures based on the pandemic. Guess what? If you map those schools against poverty uh, metrics of the city, you're gonna see that almost all the schools that have gone back online are in poorer neighborhoods. And postal codes that are from wealthier communities are almost still all in person. So these kind of inequalities highlighted by the pandemic, I think are very important as we think through the publicness of education itself. Um, I know from talking to Don Bundy while I was, you know, working at the Global Partnership for Education that, um, you know, there's this rising recognition about the role played by adolescents and the interface between health and education among adolescents. The discoveries that we're making about brain plasticity, I think, are very important. So previously, we could easily say, like, just focus on early learning, foundational literacy, uh, early childhood. Today, I think we need to widen our gaze and really ask, how do we create uh, flexible and adaptable learning for kids, youth, and young adults to get ready for this uh, period of economic challenge that comes with the fourth industrial revolution? I'd be very keen to hear your insights from the health side on particularly this challenge, because it's easy enough to go back to the unfinished business of education for all. And, Clearly, we failed when it comes to producing uh, education systems or helping education systems to support uh, broad-based but uh, measurable learning outcomes. But what about for adolescents? Where should we be focusing our attention? What should we be saying about that generation of kids, uh, that age group? And just to say, uh, I am chairing the working group that's working on international cooperation and uh, writing a small piece on that as an input to the commission. So I'm, again, just coming back to this global health governance and the interface lessons from that in relation to education, the interface between education and health, which I think remains quite imperfect. If you go into a, any country, you're gonna really see that health and education ministries are not sort of uh, well aligned to deliver the most important services. So how can we solve those problems? How can we address that challenge in this futures report, looking not just to 2030 or post pandemic, but to this 2050 horizon? I'm gonna stop there because I wanna make sure there's plenty of time for a conversation. So thank you, Noah, and uh, thank you all for joining today. Great, thank you, Karen and Noah. Uh, Martin, do you wanna jump in with comments or thoughts? And then Dan, if you would do the same. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Doug. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm outside the Abbe de Madassou here in Belgium, and it's interesting as you talk to reflect on the changes that have gone on in education in the last 200 years. 
we've moved from a system where religious education was certainly prominent in Europe to a, a system where the public and, and governments took on that responsibility. And when Noah talks about the futures of education, I think he's very right in talking about the plethora of possibilities, but the importance of having the state take responsibility and to accept that there must be education for all has been central to the fresh partnership. And I do want to refer to a paper that was written for the future of education by John Buchanan et al, which also looked at the different parts of education and how they haven't always been stuck together in the best way. And we're talking there about the difference between ECE, primary and secondary and TVET, and how then they're given a, a place into the world of work, which is open for all and equal. I do want to pick up on some other things Karen and Noah have said around the inequities and, and the difficulties in making sure that everyone has the same possibilities in order to access education. Uh, and we know from our work that equity and digital equity is a, at a really problematic stage of development. And while we see some systems going fast track into certain forms of digital development around the educational sphere, the value and, and way in which they work in terms of the child's experience is by no means evidence-based or clear. And there's a lot of work also going on about difficulties with screen time. And I want to put in this conversation right in the middle the work of this partnership, which is about developing physically well, healthy, and whole children who are able to operate not only as individuals, but also in their society. And I think when we look at a fractured future of education, it's very easy to get caught in a process where we allow those who have the resources to continue to advance and everybody else to flounder. And that's not gonna work for countries, for students, for societies. And it's something that we must at all costs make sure we avoid. I think the Delors report kicked off a conversation which has led to curriculum work that's gone on for the last 30 years that's been progressive and forward looking. It's my hope that this futures project is going to do the same thing and that it will be centered on the holistic development of the child and the holistic development of the system so that the system doesn't work in a way which advantages the advantaged but keeps an evenness across the way that schools and societies operate. And we really have schools now in a position that churches were before or um, other institutions in other societies. And I think that we need to be clear about the role they play. We've been talking within the paper writing group about the school as a hub and how that might operate in a way that enables students and parents and communities to have access to the services they need, but also to be able to access education in an ongoing and lifelong way to make a reality of the lifelong education theory. I think the ILO has done some important work on this as well with the Futures of Work Commission, which came up with a human-centered future framing. And we need to think about the productive capabilities that we're developing in our students, that it can't be about just creating one type of skills and one type of student that's going to advantage some. It's got to be about developing all. I think that's a difficult problem because we have at the same time education systems that are fracturing in an organizational way. So we have a way in which we need to talk about this in an ongoing fashion that brings back together some sort of unity around educational purpose. And I think in this partnership, we've been very clear about what that unity is. And it's a unity about all of the students and all of their abilities for all of their lives. And in order to set a platform for that, you need to be really clear about the need to be healthy, to be physically active, to be accessing a broad curriculum. And I think curriculum breadth is something that hasn't come up yet in the discussion today. And I do wanna throw it into the mix because if we respond to changes in technology and the way that society is moving at such a fast pace in a way that skews both the basics of knowledge and the breadth of knowledge, then we have a problem. And that's something that goes into the discussion of a focus on STEM, for example, at the, um, at the denigration of an arts education or whatever it is. 
there has to be balance across the educational system. Uh, and if we think about the growth of education over the last few thousand years, it's been about inclusion and bringing groups in. Inclusion can't work in a way that is individually focused. It has to be socially focused. And if we've got a socially focused approach, then we have a good chance of making a better platform for everyone to be able to access the learning and the thoughts that they need. I'm thinking of some of the other challenges that Karen and Noah have laid down, which are in many ways impossible to answer. But when you look at the reach across education and health, I think the, 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 the schisms within education need fixing first, where you have parts of the educational system that are put into other departments that make them difficult to deal with. If you then start talking about the shift between education and health, you're talking about another huge bridge between different areas. And I do think the run of capital has played a part in this, and the issue has been raised by Noah and Karen in terms of that fracturing, that if we look at a commercialized future for education, we have problems. We have to have a way of thinking about it that is about the social good. And I, I wanna finish on the point that I represent teachers. We do need to make sure that we center teacher professionalism in this discussion. And I think the pandemic has thrown up the reality of that, that systems that relied on standardized exams as the only way of answering their educational systems realize that actually in the end the only thing that can make a difference is the teacher's professional judgment and their ability to give students both a connection to each other and to the lives they're going to lead so we need to have a really mature conversation about how to bring these strands back together in a way that recognizes and respects all of those elements and you never have a teacher without a student. So the teacher-student relationship is primary and must be at the center of the discussion. And I know a lot of the work that Doug is doing is about making sure that we're clear about the ability to both train and develop teachers, not just in initial teacher education, but over the whole of their lives. And ITE or initial teacher education is the first step, but it must be followed up by professional learning and development throughout a teacher's career so that groups of teachers can get together and carry on framing and molding a way of thinking about the future that makes it absolutely possible for that to move. And I'm seeing some of the notes in the chat. Certainly the rural urban split is a problem and we need to be able to make sure that systemically we can respond to the needs of students in every situation, in every national setting. That is not an easy task, but nor is it impossible. And if we put it at the center of what it is we're talking about, then we know that by 2050, we have to have a system that centers around the education and the betterment of the whole of society. I'm gonna leave it there for now, Doug, and um, I'll look forward to the discussion as we carry on. Thank you, Martin. Uh, Dan, do you wanna jump in and the perspective of education policy and leadership, the work you do? Yeah, hi everybody, uh, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to uh, to comment. And I was really uh, uh, energized and excited by uh, the comments and, and presentations today by by Noah and Karen, and in particular um, the the recognition or the the call for recognition of radical course change, um, because I think that's a really fundamental uh, uh, challenge to throw to the community in thinking about what that would look like. Uh, one of the themes that that the speakers highlighted was the place of inequality um, in education. And I think that touches on something that we've known uh, in the study of education for, for decades. And that's it, that schools, there's a tension in schools and in education around schools as centers for uh, empowerment uh, and uh, social mobility, but schools as uh, centers for social reproduction uh, and uh, the place of power and, and um, uh, wealth uh, privilege uh, within schools. So schools as 
uh, protecting the power, uh, the the power of those who already have it, uh, and advancing uh, the privileged over the the uh, less privileged. And so there's that fundamental tension uh, in education. And what would it mean to actually begin to challenge that? Uh, to to go back to uh, uh, as uh, some of the early thinkers like George Counts uh, uh, said to dare the school build a new social order. So how do we think about the school as a as a tool for truly solving issues of of inequality? One of the things that uh, we uh, talk about, and I think that that the commission touches on, is the place of curriculum uh, and knowing and knowledge uh, and. Uh, as Martin highlighted, the breadth of, of curriculum that's important, not just STEM, uh, but other fields. But taking it even a, a step further back, how are values of inequality uh, ensconced in everything the school does? So the idea of grading students uh, as passing, failing, as uh, A, uh, uh, advanced achieving, um, uh, or as average achievers, all of these things build in a sense of individual competition between students, uh, individual competition for access to future rewards, uh, being able to uh, uh, make scores on tests that send students in one track or another, that uh, open up access to post-secondary education, that open access to various types of post-secondary education. And so schools continue to play a fundamental sorting role uh, in allocating um, uh, benefits to some uh, and uh, withholding benefits from others. And so until we begin to challenge the things that the school does structurally around curriculum and how we understand what students know and can do, we won't address the issues of power and privilege uh, and inequality that schools continue to replicate. And so when you talk about radical change, I think it would be really exciting to look at those structures in education which perpetuate uh, uh, power structures uh, and how we begin to break those down. And that would be uh, truly uh, radical change. Um, and I think that would play into some of the things that we've learned from the pandemic and some of the things that the themes that, that Martin was touching on and Karen as well. Um, when we think about uh, uh, the, the underlying mental health of students. And so one of the things that has become uh, quite apparent is that students and, and children are missing the community uh, that schools provide, uh, the, the safe spaces for um, learning in a caring and, and uh, focused environment with their peers. And so what happens when you withdraw uh, students from that community, uh, the negative health outcomes that you have. And I think that speaks to Martin's idea of schools as a hub for service delivery um, by bringing children uh, into uh, these centers of community, uh, supporting their, their mental and physical health. And I really liked his uh, link between uh, the past where churches were that center of community and, and social delivery uh, and the evolution to um, schools as publicly funded um, uh, centers of education and health delivery. Um, and what would it mean to really focus on uh, truly building uh, uh, intentionally the school as the center of community? Um, we've uh, over the last uh, century, we've looked at the massification of schooling, and I think that's been critical in expanding access uh, uh, across the globe to populations that that uh, uh, have not necessarily had access. But now we need to begin to think about, okay, how, how do we uh, uh, figure out um, what uh, what size and what uh, focus of community uh, is actually best for children uh, and best for societies and best for, for the places where schools are located. So um, large schools um, with uh, large classes um, uh, where uh, the interaction between uh, students uh, and educators and other resource providers is built on, on kind of a model of efficiency rather than uh, quality. So how do we find the right balance between quality of educational experience and social engagement, quality of access to uh, the various uh, uh, aspects of education and health delivery that we're envisioning um, and efficient provision of these services. So I think there's a tension there uh, as well. I could continue to go on. This is a fascinating uh, uh, discussion to have, but I'm also cognizant that uh, we want uh, the audience to be able to engage um, so uh, I'll just uh, stop there, but I think if we really want to, uh, as I said, address issues of inequality, uh, we have to look at the structures 
that are inherent in education and uh, really interrupt the sorting function uh, of schools. Thank you, Dan and Martin for the comments and maybe to um, just open it up for uh, a freewheeling conversation. I'm going to use a high tech uh, idea of um, if you wanted to uh, make a comment or ask a question of the presenters, uh, just open up your video um, and um, wave your hand um, and I'll uh, jump. I'm not seeing everybody's face at the same time, but uh, please uh, do that. So I know that you'd like to ask a, ask a question or make a comment. And, just jump in as as uh, as as you see fit. I'm going to bounce between the two screens that I have showing faces. As we wait for people to find that video control, Irma Ala from the Global Network of Deans of Education, uh, also a member of the writing team. Irma, do you want to um, add a thought or two? Yeah, sure, Doug. Thank you for the uh, for the opportunity to comment on this. Of course, as uh, you know, I speak from the global network of deans of education, but I'm also based in South Africa at the University of Pretoria. So everything that's been said today around the inequalities that's been created by the current pandemic, of course, resonates with me because we've lived through this at a at a huge scale with access to education being severely limited for a large sections of our school going children and that also influencing access to nutrition access to all sorts of other resources that impact on the health of the students so i think the the radical changes in terms of creating uh, multiple futures for children with multiple pathways towards those futures is for me something that resonates very strongly because if if there's a challenge within what if we create only singular pathways for certain for certain groups and if that pathway then gets blocked or interrupted or disrupted then there should be multiple options um, going forward for for um, the, the most vulnerable of children so um, from my side i'm very excited about this i, I mentioned this in an earlier meeting that uh, someone said the other day that uh, the, the current pandemic is one of the best things that could have happened to, to education. And I was quite startled by that because I thought, wow, you know, we've been working so much with the challenging aspects of this. But if you think about it, this gives us the opportunity to do something that can really um, make a huge difference uh, for at least the next generation. If we get together and share our thoughts in the way that we're doing on this platform today. So thank you for creating this opportunity, Doug. Great, uh, Paul, I see you um, asking, go ahead. Paul Downs from Dublin University. Uh, thanks, Doug. Um, and, and thanks, Noah and Karen uh, for, for your presentations. Um, uh, just to sort of give some feedback from the perspective of some of the commissions which I've been involved with, with the European Commission, which have been quite future focused. Um, I, I think that the, the notion of the, the school as a community lifelong learning centre, that is a one stop shop bridging health and education, is I think a very exciting idea. The idea there would be that, that the school could be a gateway also into more specialist services. So, for example, the issue of trauma uh, and, you know, we have children across so many cultures experiencing trauma from different sources. So, so that is something which is affecting their education, but also their health and well-being. So we, we'd like to move from the discourse of individual education plans to individual, uh, you know, education and well-being plans. And, and so, so I really urge you to, you know, to, to build, uh, to reconfigure space as well. So that's just another dimension of this is how we can reconfigure our spatial understandings of school, not only regarding outdoor education, but particularly regarding health and education services. Obviously, in the European context, you have some countries like France that would have a nurse, for example, in every school, in Finland, in many schools, but it goes beyond just, you know, one isolated professional. It's about, you know, bringing down the Cartesian boundaries between emotion and, uh, you know, and the mind and the body and, and the mind. And so, so I, I really would encourage your commission to, to really build on this one-stop shop and gateway idea. I would also just, just bring in um, a, a question around the focus on becoming, which seems somewhat a shift away from being. And I'd be curious for your thoughts around that. 
that that um I, I, you know obviously the notion of learning as a treasure within and learning to be there was a notion of inner resources of the children that are not there just to be you know marshaled in, in for instrumental purposes through a sort of external environmental conditioning so i'm just kind of wondering about the being in becoming and and and, and where the status of being is you know even the very notion of being able to ex be present in the lived moment and lived ex the capacity to experience nature to be present in the lived moment where 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 is all of that in, in the vision in, in the focus on becoming it, i think it resonates also i think it was at the point with, which karen made about the need to to maybe uh, reconfigure our patterns of consumption and perhaps that also means we need to reshape our modes of experience into more being type modes rather than having and consumerist type modes and i'll just finish up with one other final point which is on the vision of human flourishing and well-being here regarding the role of the arts and i know karen you raised the issue of adolescence and it would just seem to me that that that, that, that you're, you're your whole document uh, is a great opportunity for the arts to be uh, re-envisioned in education, you know, because the arts, you know, both have a huge inclusion role, meaning making role, agency and voice role, uh, active citizenship role, uh, outdoor education dimension. So I'm just curious, again, as to where you might see the arts uh, as being central for your vision of the future in education. Great, thank you, Paul. Karen or Noah, do you want to re respond to Paul's comment about being or versus, or not versus, but being and becoming? Karen, you want me to start or? <clears throat> Well, I'll just say that I think it's a it's a very provocative question in some ways because obviously to become to we are actually you know philosophically being and becoming at the same time. Uh, but I think uh, because Noah is the philosopher, I might hand it over to him. But just to say that the being piece and and the notion of embodied learning, I think that's very important, and I hope we will in include that in in the in the framing that comes out uh, in the final commission report. Noah. Yeah, I mean, just to echo that, I think, thank you, Paul, that's a great point. I, I mean, being understood in relation, to, you know, as to having and consuming, I think is, is, is really valuable, important to preserve. And the becoming is, I don't think, intended by anyone to replace that. Uh, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's more to invoke, uh, you know, um, kind of learning and growth and development is a constant ongoing process. Uh, it's also to invoke the suggestion that, you know, uh, collectively, you know, human societies uh, can become something they have not yet become. Um, so it's trying to work those two angles. Um, honestly, I think that uh, um, learning to become together might actually be a better uh, sort of way of capturing um, the sentiment that's there. Um, a couple of you mentioned Delors. Uh, you know, it's interesting to reread that, um, and it is a bit striking how um, individual focused uh, it is. And that's not to be lost. Um, I think that when you look at uh, some of the themes threaded through the Commission's work, uh, a real emphasis is being placed on what individuals can accomplish together. And of course, you know. Um, you know, the, the 2030 agenda um, really uh, is a key platform for that, um, as is the recognition that, you know, we face uh, problems that are collective and need to be faced together in a way that maybe was not as acutely perceived um, in the 90s. It may have been as true, but I don't think it was as acutely perceived. Uh, arts, education, full agreement. I don't know if Karen, you want to say, I mean, just noting that down, the importance of, of, of including that. So, over. I'm, I see a lot of hands up, so I'll pass it. Okay, then Leslie, uh, do you, have you learned how to use this technology? And Don, if you want to do, uh, ask your question or make your comment. Um, if people, other folks, if there is a, a button there to raise your hand. As Leslie and Don have done so well. Leslie? Hi, thank, thanks. Uh, it's a, a really fascinating webinar, and I, I think there's a great value in this discussion moving forward. Um, <clears throat> and it's great to get this group together. Now, the one key thing that I want to respond to is Karen's point about what 
what health brings to this, this table and what, what we can do. And I think the key way that I would like to phrase it is that the school can be a platform for health and healthy children learn better. So we have to put this together and that's what school health and nutrition programs do. Pre-pandemic, there were, there were about 400 million kids getting fed by school feeding through school feeding programs. But there were still 73 million kids not being reached pre-pandemic. Now, through the pandemic, there was no, and we saw great improvements, not only in enrollment, but going back to Noah's point about quality, we saw improvements in, in literacy, numeracy, uh, in the, some RCTs, for example, in Ghana, that showed that especially the numeracy in girls went up if they were in the school feeding program schools. But through the pandemic, everything's collapsed. So there was people, lots of people thinking outside the box, how do we get the, the kids keep, keeping learning? And in uh, my primary um, focus is on Africa and this digital learning, it, it kind of works sometimes, but not all. And what we were trying to do is think, you know, how do we even at the very least keep the food to the kids. So for example, in Tanzania, they, the, ki the people, the teachers are cooking the food and taking it to the kid's house just to make sure that they, and when they gave the food, they gave the, the lessons for the, the year on paper. And so when you look at all of the evidence, and I think this has been highly um, eloquently put in DCP3, DCP in, the, the biggest return that we can find for education is pulling the school health, nutrition, school feeding into the systematic piece on education. We're getting the kids back into school, they're getting fed, they're healthier, we can have the package, we can put deworming onto that, we can put um, vision screening onto that. And now I think that the, what we should be thinking in the school health and nutrition community is how do we pull that all back? When we work how to pull the, the kids back into school safely, and I think that's where I've heard about this frag fragmented piece, and I think it is, but I think it has to be because it's all contextual. And we have to work with the communities, we have to work with the regional platforms we have to work with with the government platforms and I'm not hearing a lot about what we think as this group we can contribute to supporting governments and and regional platforms to to enable that a little bit better so I'd, I'd really value some advice and some thoughts from the group about how how we do pull this back to a, an even keel thank, thank you, you. Leslie, Don. Not being. Uh, mic needs to be on. Your mic needs to be on. Click on your mic. I think there we go. Got it. Sorry about that. That's the uh, the, the isn't that the amateur the amateur mistake in uh, in Zoom. So I apologize for that. The uh, what I want to say is that uh, Doug, thank you for putting this meeting together. It's all you always do a great job. Um, and, and big thanks to Noah, Karen. Martin and Dan for raising these uh, the, the issue of health and um, health and nutrition in the context of of education in a, in a new and very thoughtful way and I think that this uh, this commission has a, a terrific role to perform. Um, I'm not going to focus on the building back from COVID issue, which is in, I think actually what pretty well occupies all of us at the moment in the in the health and nutrition area. It's how how. The, how does one respond to the pandemic? How does one build back from the pandemic? But I want to talk about the longer term issues about how we think about health and, and health and education uh, together. Uh, you know, this is a group that is, uh, this group, I'm talking about the fresh group that holds this meeting, um, has focused on neglected populations, has seen the school children as neglected in health and adolescents particularly neglected in health. And yet there's been, I think, some hesitancy in both the health and education communities to really talk about using 
uh, these opportunities to, to think about health and education together. And part of that hesitancy, I think this is really uh, the, the central point I want to make, has been around the, the, the so-called Heckman curve. This is the curve that shows benefit cost analysis by age in terms of, of investing in the health and nutrition of young people. Um, and classically showing a sort of almost exponential decline in benefit with age. So what it made clear and what, what, it, you know, what, what very reasonably it made clear was that investing in health early in life, early child development investments had a much higher rate of return uh, than investments later. And whatever we want, want to think about that in terms of the, the theoretical arguments, which are quite strong, the practical evidence now, and I think this is now indisputable, is that the rates of return are in fact remarkably flat through age and that absolutely you need to invest early, but you need to carry on with that investment in health, that the children, that the children in, um, around puberty need investment and that the children in adolescence in particular need investment. And that if you invest only right at the beginning, you still need to invest to secure the gains uh, of, that, of those beginnings so that the children that have an early start in life that's strong need to sustain that strong start. Equally, you need to think about periods of vulnerability uh, later in life. And Karen gave the great example of mental health um, and, and mental development and how most of that in fact happens in quite late adolescence. I mean, all the, all the things we think of as problematical about, about adolescence are related to that brain, brain development period. Mental health issues emerge in adolescence. Behaviors that we um, regret or which we uh, associate with Ill, Ill health later in life are usually established during adolescence. So these are really crucial periods and they need an education response just as much as they need a, a specific health response. So, so my message actually overlaps very much with what Martin and Dan were saying about, about breadth, about, about thinking about not only the need for age-specific education, but also to think about age-specific health interventions uh, that, that, that match that, that we need to think differently about how health and education come together during puberty from how we think about that uh, during adolescence. So those are the those are the points I uh, I wanted to share. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Don, rather. Further comments or questions, please uh, click on your mic and just jump in or uh, push your, raise your hand. Um, as we're we're coming up to the uh, to the end of this hour, but we scheduled ninety minutes for the whole fresh meeting, um, so we have some time to work with here. <clears throat> Further questions or comments for Noah or Karen? Uh, just in response to a, a, a procedural question, we will be uh, posting the slides uh, that Noah used onto the freshpartnersdart.org uh, website um, in the webinars page, and um, you'll be able to access them there, and as well as the recording. Further comments or questions before we begin to think about closing off the discussion or, or maybe beginning discussion uh, by email and by uh, uh, other exchanges rather than this face-to-face -face meeting. Hello, Doug, this is Emily and I'm not finding my, my hand. So can I come in now? Sure, go ahead, yes. First of all, let me join the others in, in thanking you for organizing this webinar and for uh, Karen and Noah and, and all colleagues for their insights. It's been really a very rich and, and much welcome discussion and, and a great opportunity to, to exchange with the team and very promising discussion to, to continue during the year. The only thing I wanted to add, Doug, is uh, I think this is really of, of broad interest for all the partners working on school health and nutrition. And I'll be happy to see how we can also invite the other agencies that are part of the interagency group working on school health and nutrition to contribute to the paper and to join forces to, to frame the discussion in, in terms of school health and nutrition and its contribution to the futures of education. Yeah, but that would be great. Thank you, Emily. Further questions? Emily works with the these uh, 
there's a joint initiative of several UN agencies focused on school health and nutrition, uh, just, the inter just the agencies uh, rather than the broader fresh coalition. And uh, that's a good, really good connection to be made. Further questions or comments? Okay, I'll, I'll maybe start to think about, oh, sorry, go ahead, Paul. I, I was just going to ask about future dialogue or ongoing dialogue with, uh, you know, with our group and, and you know, Noah and Karen and others. I'm just wondering, what, are there further processes envisaged um, uh, or, or what, what do you know and Karen advise us, you know, if we, if we are trying to build up our arguments, the coherence of our arguments to influence the, the development of, of your, your report? Well, I would just say, and Noah, please uh, contradict me if I'm not understanding the timeline, but we're on a very tight timeline now. And so my suggestion would be to, you know, in, including to the School Health and Nutrition Network, this would be a good time to put in a one or two page brief on key messages that you'd like to see. But I really urge you, and I think the, the challenge that we face is that exactly as um, Don suggested, that people are pulled into the pandemic discourse and that ends up being very front and center, especially among the development assistance sort of uh, linked communities. And we're trying to think to 2050. So please, if you are gonna do a brief, try to think from 2050 uh, backwards to today rather than from today up to 2050 uh, and really get that future focus because that part, that actually is the most challenging for everybody, yeah? Is to think about these, this longer frame of future. So just, that would just be my suggestion, get a, get a brief in as soon as you can, because the commissioners are, are now starting to look at, are about to start, Noah, correct me if I'm wrong, start to look at, at drafts of the chapters. Yeah, so by the, end of, uh, by the end of this month, by the end of April, so May 1st would be, would be uh, uh, the best deadline to get something in. Thanks. And then Noah, maybe you could tell, I, I actually haven't followed the sort of, because now we're just thinking about the report itself, but there'll be a post report phase where I think the commission will be encouraging people to take the report and then have debates, discussion, sort of do some planning around the report. But Noah, what, maybe you can say more about yeah, what Yeah, no, thank you. Thanks for bringing that up, Karen. Yeah, I mean, the report will come out in November of 2021. Um, and uh, it, the hope is that they will be, regional discussions. I mean, it's styled, and this is important in the UNESCO world, it's styled as a global report, um, but there's clearly uh, going to be a need to regionalize it. Uh, and then we're hoping that that people will, you know, take it apart, honestly. Uh, also, you know, point out, you know, what it accomplishes and what it still doesn't yet accomplish. Um, so uh, we're hoping that it can, you know, serve uh, as a prompt for further conversations. So one phase, uh, would be, Paul would be right now for the next month. Um, and then again, uh, later in the year um, and in the next year. So sending comments, uh, I, I will make sure um, that in the follow-up, uh, a link to the progress update um, gets circulated uh, and comments can come in by email to futures of education at unesco.org, it's in the document. Uh, there's also a web platform if that's easier for you to submit through. Um, Great, thank you, Noah and Karen. And maybe just to uh, respond to Paul's comment from the Fresh Partners point of view, we, we have a writing team with um, the, led, led, I'm pleased to say, by the education partners of the Fresh Partnership. Uh, and uh, we'll be circulating the draft and, and um, working towards that meeting that end of April submission time. And um, we'll be doing that by email primarily. Um, and submitting it as best we can. And as per our normal procedure, we'll be asking organizations within the partnership to endorse or to send their own comments directly into the Futures of Education Commission so that, um, so that uh, they can receive the brief. I'd like to finish off with a couple of thoughts basically from Noah and Karen's presentation. And Noah was kind enough to focus on the rebalancing of, uh, uh, of education between um, the commercial and the, the private and the, uh, the collective or the community interests. And I think the, that caught me in terms of rebalancing among the purposes of education. Um, and it connects to the second point I'm gonna make. We, we need to think about education as, as being both academic, 
vocational and social in terms of their purposes. And the functions of schooling are well documented in lots of research documents. And we've always um, struggled in the health sector or the health and social sector in competing with the academic or the intellectual functions of schooling. And um, largely ignored the custodial function, the taking care, providing food, protecting, uh, protecting kids, safe kids, sanctuary, those things, which are legitimate in and of their own right. We've always tried to persuade educators of the, the value of what Dolores would call the learning to learn and the learning to do functions. Um, and I think we need to think about the, the custodial or the learning to be and the learning to live together functions as being equally important. Uh, I was on a call with, um, organized by the Wise Foundation in Qatar, uh, where, where um, a presentation was made about the, how academic, the academic bias has really uh, maybe refocused or, or distorted the, the original purposes of the schooling, which were social and, and custodial. Um, as well as being and, and the intellectual and the vocational purposes may have overwhelmed them. And then to Karen's point about how health and education sectors can work together, that's kind of been uh, something that many of us are in this call have been working on for years. And we do our best, but I think it's we've been always looking to persuade educators to take on health and social issues rather than saying, what's the joint interest? What are the joint purposes? Um, the Fresh Partnership and the many other different agency groups do offer a way of doing that through the various frameworks that we promote, the Fresh Framework or the School and Health and Nutrition Framework or the Safe Schools Framework. Um, those need to be thought about as system organizers. And, and I think uh, if, if one thought from my experience as a former lobbyist and uh, um, policy analyst is that we need to think a lot about how systems change and, and, and to build that into our thinking rather than just saying what the future should be, we need to sort of delineate some pathways towards that. And I think the fresh framework and similar frameworks offer those kinds of organizing ways of doing that. So maybe to, to offer that as a thought, which will um, obviously be we trying to include in, in the brief that's going to be made by, the, by this group. Um, closing off with any, uh, any other comments or questions. Um, I'm going to just finish up with, the, with turning off the recording in a moment, but any further thoughts, Noah, Karen, uh, Dan, or Martin? I'll just, I'll just quickly come in and thank you all for the, the time and the ideas, it's, uh, taking excellent, taking extensive notes, and this is really helpful. So I look forward to future input as well. Thanks. Okay. Martin? Yeah, I'll just jump in with one, which really is a challenge to the commission about how we construct an argument around education, which looks at reinvesting over the next 30 years, because we're all in a position now where economies are fragile. And it seems to me that the reach of the state into education needs to become more serious, not less. And how might you go about doing that in the position the commission's in? when you have all of the different countervailing forces on you. I don't think we can achieve the things we're talking about in this webinar, about working across education and health, about developing the whole life of the whole citizen without that sort of level of commitment. So I'm just interested in how we might do that. You know, I just, I, I, I would also just jump in and then also say thank you to everybody for attending. And I'm looking forward to seeing the brief, possibly two briefs, one from the School Health and Nutrition Network and one from Fresh uh, come in to, to, for the commissioners to sort of review and uh, for the secretariat also to sort of think through. Martin, I think my own sense is that we're in a bit of a different world today than we were uh, before the pandemic. And although I am not a big fan of the Build Back Better uh, discourse that you see circulating, I also have, am beginning to think that uh, with Bidenomics taking over in the US and with uh, evidence, very palpable evidence that government capacity has been a major predictor of the ability uh, of, of ma in management of the pandemic, I actually think we're going to turn towards a much bigger focus on um, big public sector uh, um, investments uh, going forward. The, the problem really is, can we get our international actors 
uh, in particular, our international um, development banks to move as quickly as the uh, as the evidence suggests. And I, I think we're going to have a problem there because they still operate in a sort of uh, environment uh, in which they think mostly about fiscal constraint, not about the value of increased investment. And a good example of that it can be seen in the way the bank is spending against the pandemic. Yesterday, the CGD released its uh, review and showed that the bank is um, vastly underspending to solve this pandemic crisis. So it's likely to be a laggard. So some of our some of our development finance institutions are, are likely to be laggards in education um, and in health, I think, overall. And we need to push them to, to move faster so that we get this whole of system approach and this idea that governments can do more and have to be at the center of any solution to, um, I think, what, what really amounts to going to, towards 2050, probably a period of the greatest disruption for school systems that we've ever experienced. And, uh, an, a period where we really are going to need uh, large-scale government investment. So that's just my thought. Thank you, Karen. Um, kind of a <laughs> sobering but important note to close off. That. But Dan, do you want one final thought? Yeah, I wanted to uh, uh, thank Karen for her, her comments because I think that's going to be a really key issue. Uh, and one of the things to, to keep an eye on is is the extent to which uh, private corporations and companies uh, view education as a as a profit center, uh, and will try to step in and uh, co opt the the public funding and public purposes that are are provided to to buttress education. And so I appreciate the uh, the commission's focus on uh, on public education and and public uh, support and control of education, <clears throat> and to recognize that there are. Uh, very many forces out there that see this as a profit center and that will be poised to, to jump in and, and take advantage of uh, additional investment and, and perhaps co-opt uh, the, the benefit that may be available otherwise. So thank you for letting me participate in this, uh, in this uh, webinar. I very much enjoyed everybody's uh, comments and, and contributions and, and I think the work of the Futures Project uh, can really lead to some place special for education given its uh, interest in radical uh, radical reform and radical change uh, for for social good. Thank you, Dan, and a good good place to stop. I'm going to stop.